name is Stephen Tramer. I have presented here a couple of times. Today I am here to talk to you about how to write Swift Glue code, uh, good glue code. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about that, and we're going to have some examples, and uh, I'm also going to do some live programming because I came up with a good example last evening. Uh, so things are going to go horribly wrong right over the top. It's going to be great. It's going to love it. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I am a software developer and I have been professionally for a very long time now, like 16 years, something like that. Uh, the best Shaw Brothers movie is just The White Lotus. Please go watch it. It's available on YouTube. Uh, I wrote software that helps run the Large Hadron Collider a number of years ago. Um, I also was a teacher and a professional writer for a period of time, so you may know that. Uh, now, I work at a company that has a booth out there, AOL. Uh, we do still have dial -up. It's fantastic out here. I work on the advertising team. I uh, produce the mobile SDK there. It's super good. You should come out and talk to us. We got some nice things in the booth. Whatever. Uh, I work there with this guy. I've met him. He's exactly like Nathan Barley. Have you guys seen Nathan Barley? You should watch it. Great. All right. So. Here's what this talk is going to go through. Um, might go through a little fast. There's a lot of stuff. Don't worry, the slides and the sample project will be available on GitHub in my next week. And I'll post that in Slack so everybody can do it. So, migration basics and what is blue code? You guys probably know a lot of the terms that I'm going to use in this talk already, but if you don't, you might have ideas that are different from my ideas, and it would be great if we all have the same idea. Otherwise, my talk may not be as useful to you as you would like. Um, there are a lot of warnings that are going to come along with this talk because this talk is focused on Swift 3. Swift 3 is currently released as beta 6. There were changes checked into the Swift repo 20 hours before I gave this talk that affect the content of it. Uh, we're going to go through preparing your Objective C source base for migration. Uh, building the actual blue code itself. This is where the sample project comes in. So there's actually a working demonstrable sample project that will demonstrate this. Uh, and then, if there's time, and hopefully there will be, I'll get into the really good stuff where we'll talk about directly calling into Swift from C, which is possible and it's a little gnarly, but you can do it and it's performant and you get to avoid funks and all kinds of great stuff. So, uh, in the summary, it says that this talk focuses on bottom-up migrations. Bottom-up migration is uh, code tends to call down the stack. So your UI tends to call your components, and your components tend to call some sort of tool. Um, the UI and a or API layer stability is crucial. When I say UI layer stability, I mean UI code, not UI elements. If you work on an SDK, like I do, API layer stability is priority number one, and that means that if you are going to do a code, code <laughs> migration, um, you're going to be doing it bottom up. You're not going to rewrite your API. We're going to talk a little bit about that too. Um, common code should be easily modularizable into some sort of core layer at the very bottom of your stack. This will make migration a lot easier because you have a good logical starting point. Start there, work your way up. Um, and Objective-C, the one fundamental problem with this is that Objective-C calling to well-designed Swift is not particularly easy. And when I say well-designed Swift, I mean Swift that takes correct advantage of exceptions, structs, enumerations with associated types that derive from classes. Objective-C is not good at playing nice with any of those things. Uh, we're actually going to talk about all of them wrap them and how to call them directly and memory map them against objects that you can use in Objective-C. So, <clears throat> what is blue code? Blue code is the interoperability layer. We're going to be writing it in Swift. There will be parts of it that will be written in C. And the whole reason for that is you want the Swift code that you write to map onto either Objective-C or C. Um, there's some really good capabilities in Swift for mapping to Objective-C. Calling from Swift to Objective-C is super easy. Right? Um, blue code should allow you to follow best practices in Swift while maintaining compatibility with your older code that you are either currently 
forced to maintain or now consider legacy code that's kind of just sitting there while you work on the next iteration of the product. Blue code is also transient. You're supposed to throw it away when you're done. Um, the real problem with this is that blue code is also time consuming to write. Let's take a look at this. Um, people will naturally ask, why would you want to do this if it is both transient and time consuming? Well, it's because doing an entire product migration from Objective-C to Swift all at once is even more time consuming. We have even more compiler problems. We're gonna have states where the product won't build. You're gonna, also, it's gonna take a massive amount of time and manpower. Um, and you want to follow Swift best practices, and if you're writing fully Objective-C compatible Swift code, you cannot do that. Can't use structs, you can't use any of those cool enum features. Using uh, exceptions is possible, but not necessarily easy. Um, and then also the ideal state of blue code is that you can automate generating. Uh, blue code is meant to be so boilerplate that you can have a tool plug into the compiler chain right for you. Um, which is something I was hoping to do, and then did not. So my apologies. Uh, these are the warnings, first set of warnings. Um, you guys are going to see a lot of these numbers up here, SE followed by four digits. Those are Swift Evolution documents. Swift Evolution documents document the changes that are being made to the compiler roughly in real time, and they provide you with an enormous amount of documentation of what certain features do, how you use them, and what it means from a practical standpoint. The naming problem referred to here is API naming guidelines for Swift for Objective-C are different. Swift has its own set of API guidelines. Objective-C has its different set of API guidelines, published by Apple that we've hopefully been using for many, many years now. And there's an automated translation layer that the Swift compiler does between the two, which is fully described by these evolution documents. Um, what this means is that this is why you don't rebuild an API in Swift right now you will encounter the naming problem, and it'll be really weird. Like Swift wants to do things like convert, um, we could say init with string. Swift converts that to init, and then the parameter name is string. Sometimes that results in really weird things. Um, like for example, in the auto-generated Swift API for RSK, there's a method called initialize user info only in the user info. It's totally unintuitive. Um, I already mentioned this, applies to Swift 3 beta 6 only. It's in the Xcode, latest Xcode beta as of uh, a week ago. But there's another one today. Um, Swift does not have a stable API. This is a really big deal because Chris Lattner said Swift 3 will have a stable API, and then he said Swift 4 will have a stable API. So hopefully Swift 4 will actually have it. No stable API means a lot of things, but for developers who maybe don't care about this, ABI is essentially the set of calling conventions that define how is a function name mangled, how are arguments passed, is there type erasure, how do thunks work, uh, lots of nitty gritty compiler internals that guarantee that if I build with one version of the Swift compiler, any other version of the Swift compiler can also use that code for those object file sessions. Um, Swift is framework only. This bit me while I was doing my example project. The no stable API means it is framework only, which means if you ship Swift code today, it has about five megabytes to your application or your library. Because it has to include every Swift library that you use, the core libraries, anything that is not an Objective C framework, it has to ship with your Swift library. Right? That means things can get big fast. Uh, and the last one is Bitcode and optimization are absolutely going to affect the direct calls to Swift that we're going to talk about there. Bitcode affects it because um, when you produce Bitcode, what you're really doing is you're not producing assembly code, you're producing something called LLVMI, intermediate language that is meant to map very closely to assembly. Uh, and then you ship your Bitcode off to the App Store, and when somebody downloads the app from the App Store, Apple's servers just-in-time compile that LLVM library to 
if you don't know exactly what that compiler does, some of these direct calls will not work. There will actually be a simply this on. Uh, even at O0, Swift does some optimizations that can make it very difficult to do direct now. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the actual talk. Preparing for migration is heavily annotate your Objective-C code with nullable and non-null. Non-null makes things, makes the Objective-C compiler realize you should never return or pass a null value here. And nullable says it's okay to pass a null. This is equivalent to saying whether or not something is allowed to be an optional type in Swift. If something is non-null, it cannot be an optional. If it is nullable, it could be an optional. Um, there is a macro that really helps with this. NS assume non null. If you put NS assume non null begin at the top of the header file, NS assume non null at the end, it assumes that everything is non null. It behaves as though you are writing Swift method definitions. Where everything is a non nil value, unless you explicitly say this is allowed to be nil. These are incredibly useful. Last one, generics. Use generics, like everywhere. They're great. Um, the Objective-C compiler is not particularly smart about generics, but when you import an Objective-C header into Swift, which you will have to do no matter what kind of migration strategy you're using, Swift will correctly type the annotate. Um, and for those of you in the audience who know about covariance and contravariance, Objective-C currently supports those annotations for generic types, and Swift does not. So at some point, Swift is going to have covariance and covariance, for people who actually want that. Um, next up, enumerations. Enumerations, you should be declaring them with NS enum. Option bit flag should be declared with NS options. These are little macros. You put them after a type def, you fill them out just like you would a regular enum, and it's essentially a code annotation where if you follow a specific naming convention, Swift will correctly import these things as Swift enumerations. Very useful. Here's an example from our SDK, uh, which is banner sizes. We enumerate banner sizes. So we provide it with a type, uh, in this case, tennis integer, they're all integer types. We provide it with the name of the enumeration. And then each element in the enumeration starts with the base name and then has the proper name. So this would map to the Swift type and then inline add size with the members banner, large banner, medium rectangle, full banner, leaderboard, and flexible. And this option is the same thing. You provide it with a bit flag, same sort of field. There we go. And Swift makes it a composable type, so you can correctly uh, define this flight. You guys still hear me? Where's my microphone? All right. Here's another one. Uh, C imports. Swift now has this cool new feature as of Swift 3, where you can specify an attribute. A C function definition. Sorry, declaration prototype. Automatic promotion is available for things that have CS in it. So like CG size, CG point, all of that stuff, automatically imported in this kind of style. Um, you'll notice that in the import as method down here for rotate point 3D, the first argument to Swift is named as self, which makes this a method on the class. And the initializer does not have a self argument, which creates it as a static method in the class. Uh, functions as an initializer. This is fully described in SE0044, um, which I took those examples from. It is a fantastic document. This is a new feature of Swift 3, and it's super good. Another new feature is external cons. You have lots of strings floating around in your application, as keys for dictionaries, for example. You probably have a lot of these. Uh, so if you've got a series of them, there's specialized typedef, which is this. Typedef 
type a thing attribute, uh, and then you decide whether you want it to represent Swift as a struct or an enum, and then you just annotate things with that type. You're basically declaring a specialized type that these values then become a member of. I haven't used this myself yet. This is a, seems like a very important feature for Swift 3. Um, struct is used for extensible enumerations, things like error domains, error codes. Um, enum is used for non-extensible enumerations. Like, these are the three types of things that will always be in it. Enumeration, that kind of stuff. This is also fully described in a Swift evolution document, SE0033. Uh, this has many examples in it. Again, very good. All right, now let's talk about errors. Preparing for the migration of errors. It, Swift 3 has another new macro in it. Uh, I tried it out in Xcode beta 8, beta 6, and it did not work. They say the proposal has been accepted. I don't know if this is true or not. But it functions basically like NS enum. You provide it a type, a name, and then because it's an error, you also provide a new name. And then Swift automatically generates an enum that inherits from error that allows you to throw this type of enumeration as an error. Uh, full description is in Swift uh, Evolution 0112. Again, it's a good document. These things are very well written, by the way. Um, the Swift Evolution process is very well awesome. Uh, and then maybe not yeah. All right, so let's talk about some basic pitfalls. Um, I was building a command line tool for my sample because what could be easier to build than a command line tool that takes some command line input and it does some stuff to it? Uh, unfortunately, it's actually very hard to do this with Swift. Um, the issue is that the way that command line things look up executable information doesn't really work if you have the command line tool written in Objective C and you have the framework written in Swift because of that whole ABI thing where you have to include all the Swift. Uh, there's a link here that is incredibly helpful. Um, and you will be able to click on that link from what I have on slides. Slides are going to look the uh, Another thing frameworks cannot use bridging headers, so you have to manually create a module. Manually create a module by creating a module map, which is well described by the LLVM documentation. Um, and we'll go over the module map that I created in the sample project so that you can see how you would write one that allows Swift to access like C struct types, which is very nice. Um, the only problem there is that you might need to delete some erroneous import statements because it'll think that the module that's just really a bridging header is a real module, and then try and import it into Objective C through the bridging header, uh, which you don't want because it won't find it in. All right, so now we finally get to talk about the Swift side of things. The main thing that you guys are going to be using all the time is the AppOpC annotation. You can apply it to all kinds of things. Classes inherited from an MS object. Protocols. Enums that have the raw type int without associated objects. Cannot use it with any other enumerated type. And you do have to declare things public, things that are not, I'm going to save questions for the end, so, but if it's like super relevant, you can write this down. Is int, it is actually the type int. It's not int64, it's not int32, it's int. It's the Swift type int. Um, Okay, enumerations of raw type in. Oh, public. Uh, obviously, it also only applies to things that are marked as public. If you try to use obviously with anything private, protected, or those two new types of access that they added in Swift 3 like a week ago, uh, the compiler will just silently ignore it. It doesn't give you a warning or anything. Uh, so make sure that 
things are explicitly labeled as public in addition to having this annotation. Uh, it's also the only way to get optional protocol methods in Swift right now. Swift is silently phasing out optional protocol methods. They would prefer that you use an empty default implementation in a protocol if it's optional, uh, which I think is actually a very good change. Um, and then that OPC does not prevent call optimizations. I talked about this a little bit in my 2014 talk when Swift first came out, because um, at the time it did prevent call optimizations. What it does now is OPC generates a wrapper method that's a thunk. Uh, if you're familiar with what that is, it is a kind of like a lightweight wrapper that when you call through the Objective C runtime to a Swift method, calls that as it's in, and then that dispatches to Swift. It does all the type wrapping and unwrapping. That's where the type transitions come from. Uh, next slide, we'll kind of get into it a little bit later. This is Swift intermediary language, if it looks super weird to you. Um, but the important things to notice here are that there is the method at the top, which is the Swift obviously test method. If I have to file a set of the intermediate language. And then there's the thunk down here, which is the Objective-C. And you'll notice that all the Objective-C thing does is just like, sorry, I'm going to read it a little. Um, it unwraps values, calls the method, and then responds. That's how we uh, talk about Swift intermediate language. So, built in sensitive promotions. Um, numeric float and rule types are mapped to C primitives. Integer types are mapped to corresponding NS type. So, Swift int maps to NS integer. Uh, unsigned int maps to NS U integer. Double maps to double. Bool is a little weird because it maps to something called obc bool in Swift because the boolean type in Objective-C is actually an unsigned character and not its own type. That's a type alias for something. Uh, so obc bool is a little strange. You can also type that, you can also typecast them to ns num. These are in Swift designated by, like in Swift int inherits from ns number or it's convertible to an ns number. But it's also marked as being raw representable as the type in it, which is why it's a The Swift source is actually a very useful tool for when you want to look up how things promote internally. Um, all of the primitive types in Swift, or what you think are primitive types, are actually defined as part of the standard library. So they're not compiler intrinsics, which is great. So, built in sets of promotions part two. Array string and dictionary promote as you'd expect, but their contained types might not. It is perfectly valid to have a Swift array that contains nothing but Swift structs that you can pass to Objective-C. If it's annotated as saying, having, say, any object in it, and not a more specific type, you can totally pass that to Objective-C. You just can't do anything with the data contained in it, because it's all Swift data. Uh, and Swift structs are one of the things that do not map directly onto C structs for reasons we'll get to at the very end of my talk. So, what can you do about this? Um, you can sanitize your containers, where if you're returning a container from new code, uh, you can map, you can call map on it. Uh, both array and dictionary containers support the map operation. And inside of your map, you can call wrap methods on anything wrappable. Uh, We'll talk a little, I'll we'll talk about in the sample project what the route method that represents. And then you can return a route obviously object. Array gets passed through, it's guaranteed to contain only things representable in the C, and you're good. Alright, so I'll talk a little bit about the sample project. So now I'm the sample project time. Sample project time. Means more time. Or I'm running CRA. Running in a VM that is apparently not. Alright, so you have to bear with me because I've got a little table here and this giant monitor and people are going to know what I'm doing. Alright, so.
There's the workspace. Okay. I apologize for not having this. Oh yeah, also there's a bug. There's a bug at zero beta six where you can't drag windows. Uh, this is gonna be really bad. Double click. Oh, there we go. All right, that's so close. Um, yeah. Right here? Yeah, okay. Thank you. So, this is our Objective-C code. Um, this is a fancy uh, command line tool where you get some string input and it prints out a bunch of uh, core bits that exist in a format that is totally not sensible, but it's great for this particular demo. Um, and it can either print them all out or it takes them in the that's all. And this is a front end where all it does is it reads from the command line and it parses these values out and then it does something. Uh, this is the whole parts of it. It's pretty boring. The exciting stuff is all this is the Lipports library, which is written in Swift. So let's get down past the C stuff right now. So first things first, let's go over what the actual code looks like. It's pretty simple. We have a coordinate error, which is an extension on a C type. There is an enum, that is a subclass of nothing, that has associated types. There is a tuple, which is also not represented by types. There's a struct, which is not represented by types. Uh, there's a couple of methods on here, but I don't know how much you. Uh, it operates primarily on coordinates, and a coordinate has convenience. Alright, so now let's get into the wrapper. So the first thing is actually make this an extension on that page. So the first function that we encounter to do blue code is called wrap. All that this does is it takes our internal type of location and it wraps it to an objective C representable type location wrap. That's all it does. Nothing fancy. Um, there's a top level function in Swift here, that's pretty good. Alright, this is where the Objective-C project starts. So, position is the enumeration that has associated types. What we've got here is... So, what is position? Well, position is... If you've been a C programmer for a while, you've maybe seen tag unions. That is exactly what a Swift enumeration with associated is. It's a tag union, and that is all it is. So, we've got a union that represents each individual type that could be associated with the value. And we've got a tag that tells us what it is. Those tags are enumerated up here. And in an NSPM, because we want them correctly exposed to Swift, and that's our position. So, how do we wrap a position? Or, excuse me, unwrap a position. This takes a wrapped position and it encodes it. Well, we just switch on the tag. The tag is correctly imported into Swift thanks to the MSC now. So we just switch on A. Oh, well, if it's an A, then we just return a A with the value. If it's a B, we return B with the value. C, we return the C with the unwrapped Boolean value. This is where the weirdness of obc bool comes in. This is a Boolean type, and there is no way to convert between Swift's intrinsic bool type and Objective-C's obc bool type that 
is in complete mechanical terms. Um, so, in particular, there's not a constructor for Swift rule that takes an opposite. Uh, this is actually a lot of attack. All right, how do you route a position? This is actually, it's not particularly complicated, it's the reverse operation. Um, you also notice that wrap is a method on the enumeration, and unwrap is a static method on the enumeration. So you can unwrap anything without a particular instance, but you must always wrap the instance. Well, when you wrap an instance, okay, switch on the case, set the correct value in the beacon, and set the correct tag on the wrapper. And that's really all it takes. It's not to super evolve, just go right in. It's like it's in time. All right, so here's a function for uh, wrapping in coordinates. Tuples cannot have associated functions because tuples are just pure data. So uh, wrapper for a tuple, okay, it wraps the position and it puts the value in the wrapper and it becomes a wrapper. Our tuple wrapper looks pretty much exactly like what that it's a C struct that is a position and a value. Tuples are contiguous data in Swift, which is very useful. There's never gaps between them, it doesn't pack the structs, they are eight by the line, exactly like C structs. So you can directly map a Swift tuple onto a C struct. You don't have to worry about creating an objective C type. Uh, and by the way, we could have just as easily created an objective C type for our position wrapper, but we probably would have had to have three objective C types for that, one for A, B, and C. It's much easier to represent as a tag game. And it's more efficient, too. Efficiency is what we need. Alright, then you can also unwrap a coordinate. How do you do that? Okay, well, you unwrap a position and get the value. Right. Location wrapper. Okay, so this is the only real wrapper class because you have to wrap Swift structs. Swift structs are also generally represented as contiguous data, but they're memory managed contiguous data. They are memory managed by Swift. Swift does not actually make a guarantee that your Swift struct lives on the heap, lives on the stack or behaves in any way differently from a Swift class. It says that it's more likely to treat it like struct data, or I'm sorry, staff data, that's a good um, So, obviously you'll notice that everything here is declared public. All right, uh, you'll also notice non-obsy, which I put here to make explicit. This prevents something that is public in an obviously class from being made available to objective This is a way to do method mining from the Objective-C program. Like, for example, if you don't want somebody to swizzle a particular method, like you still have to declare a class in obc, non obc is your friend. It's a feature that many people have wanted for a very long time. All right, coordinate. Well, it's a coordinate wrapper. What does it do? It just returns the wrapped coordinate from our wrapped location. Same with the name. It returns the wrapped location's name. How do you initialize it? Okay, well, I initialize it from a coordinate wrapper in a string. You initialize a location from a coordinate in a string. This is starting to follow the theory of the world. But you guys are going Also, there is a convenience initializer here. Uh, there's a file private, which will have some new types in Swift, uh, where you just feed it a location and it just wraps it. We use that in the wrap function for the wrap function. Um, so, Swift does not have dynamic dispatch or introspection of any kind yet. It's not very good, but working on it. I should show it at some point. Um, so, you have to manually write every method that will wrap a Swift method. If there are a lot of methods on your Swift struct, will be writing a lot of these, and they will all look almost exactly like this. Uh, maybe with some wrap block. 
Uh, and then I discovered a really cool Swift plug. Um, it turns out that you can't use throws with anything that returns a struct. Uh, so you'll see that this, I created a location functions object, which is intended to access like, kind of like a singleton. And the reason for that is we want access to this right here, the function defined at the module level. You cannot put the obviously specifier directly on a function. You have to wrap that function in a class where that class's only purpose is to allow you to call it. All right, I've only got 10 minutes left, so we're going to abandon the sample project at this point. That actually covers like pretty much everything except for oh yeah, there's one more thing. The map. This is what a module map looks like. You give it a header and you tell it to export everything. Right. So, in the time remaining, I may not get to do live coding, unfortunately. But, we can talk about direct call bridging. I noticed that I mentioned contiguous data types a whole bunch. There's a reason for that. There's also a reason why those structs were laid out. Oh. Here's how you can figure out how your, your own direct call for change. This is exactly how I figured it out. So, the Swift compiler tool chain, Swift produces an AST, abstract syntax tree, which is then translated into something called Swift Intermediate Language, which is SIL, which is then translated into called the MIR, which is either bit code you ship or you compile it to a and each step provides valuable information about can this be a direct call, normally in SIR, and how do we actually make this call, which is the later steps. Um, you often have to look at not just the LLVMIR, but also the assembly, because Swift uh, does some really bad stuff with return registers. It does not use the system B return register API. It returns values in registers that are not meant to use the return registers. So you can actually lose data. And that is normally associated with functions. Alright, uh, function names. Well, there's not an official domain of attribute, but you can use this attribute, app silgen name. This produces an unmangled name that goes directly to the Swift intermediate language as that function's name. And you can just call that from C, however you want to. You may not call it correctly, but you can. Swift demangle is a nice little tool that allows you to give it a mangled Swift function name, and it'll demangle it. It's great. Um, and then this is the big one. The Swift compiler will emit SIL, IR, or assembly based on what you think. This is the number one thing that I used when preparing for this talk and figuring out data formats. So, uh, I'm going to really push up this. Uh, you need to know a little bit of assembly to like, kind of look at some stuff. I'm going to skip that because I don't think I'm going to get more of it. Enums. This is about memory and layout of the Use, obviously, if you can. Inheriting from a Swift class means you should wrap data. Instead, if you inherit from like the Swift character type, because you're writing a tokenizer or something, um, Swift character type is actually like a Unicode 32 type S. It's crazy. It's string handling, so it's very good. Um, you should probably wrap that in an Objective-C class instead, even if it has associated data. Uh, you, however, cannot put unions inside of Objective-C. Because uh, R does not know how to properly memory manage stuff like this. So. Alright, uh, I only tested this with very simple associated types. Uh, I did like the position type that we saw. That was how I figured out the data layout for that num. Turns out that the union is first and the tag is last. There may be cases where the tag is first and the union is last. All right, uh, you might recognize uh, that. So, the most important question, which I just asked. All right, 
Optionals, this is worth mentioning. Optionals are just enums. They are defined in the Swift library like any other type. They have syntax sugar because the syntax sugar is nice. It's just another type. It's an enumeration of two types, some and none. Right, and then tuples. Tuple is a contiguous block of space, just like I mentioned. It's a C stroke. Fields are ordered in the order you declare them. Um, and in fact, if it's a tuple of all of the exact same data type, for example, if you've got a tuple of three ints, just represent it as an array. And our C array is a contiguous block of space that holds a single type. Awesome. All right. Here's what tuples look like in the compiler. This is what it looks like in the simple way. Here we are returning a tuple that is an int, a double, and a position. So this will actually give you some insight into how to determine where that tag goes. Uh, the move instruction does moves. RDI is the first input register, and RAX is the return register. All right, well, it moves the value of 12 into the memory location signified by the first, by the first argument. You may notice that there's not an actual argument passed into the Swift function. It's because you are expected to allocate the memory outside of the function. This is where the line value is. So, all of this around the table. Then we move the double value in. Well, the double value appears eight bytes after the int, which makes sense, into 64 bits on a664 machine. Okay, well then the value of the position gets written. And then the position tag gets written. Position tag takes up one byte because that's the smallest 8-bit aligned memory that can hold the values 0 through 2. Because we only have three types or you know, three cases. Alright, cool live example it is not going to happen and it will definitely not like three minutes left. I sorely apologize to everyone for this. Uh, I did not time my talk because I had to rewrite large portions of it over the last two days. Okay, right, time to talk about warnings. This is the most important part of the talk. Modifying a function signature can introduce very extreme optimizations in Swift. That gen tuple method that we just saw, for example, I moved the position from the end of it. Well, it no longer wants to write to a space that I've allocated in memory. It wants to write directly to the return register and one of the floating point registers. A floating point register is not a return register, it's a floating point register. The contents there, that's not a, re that's not a designated return register in System 5. Swift 3 is not designed for operability with anything other than Objective C or Swift. This is a very serious thing to say. If you want to write a Swift library and then have a C front end, you're crazy. Don't do that again. Uh, hopefully that will change in the future. Enabling those return optimizations natively means you can register and write inline assembly to load from that register. If you do this, you really are crazy. Don't do this. Please don't. Uh, I was going to do another. Very brief word about structs. Uh, while we have a minute shot here. Um, <clears throat> first of all, structs is don't bridge structs. Like, don't directly bridge a struct as a C struct type. There's memory management, there's function tables, there's lots of stuff. Uh, don't, also, that's the second one. Just something. Everybody looks at it. Um, and then, how does switch bridge these structs? Behavior objects such as dictionary and array. Uh, I was actually going to watch a professor and show you guys seriously. Um, there's a function that is called op underscore opc bridgeable or something like that on those types. Which, I don't know, on those types, which would directly translate the internal representation to an Objective-C representation. Um, this is the change that was made 20 hours ago. That method is gone. Bridging between Swift dictionary and array and Objective-C dictionary and array now work completely differently than they did 20 hours ago. 
Uh, I cannot emphasize that enough. Switch changes very fast. Um, so, closing remarks, because we're at zero minutes, so I will close very quickly. Swift is designed for Swift only ecosystems. But Swift also has a lot of other uses. There's actually a case study where somebody wrote a Swift library that is used on Android as well. Um, and there are lots of people who want to run open source Swift on Linux and interface with the same programs. If you care about this stuff, maybe Rust is for you, which is another memory safe language that's focused on systems programming instead of applications programming. Also, Swift Evolution 0058 is a deferred proposal, not accepted. This is about allowing you to write a custom bridge your own custom glue code as part of a fully supported Objective-C bridgeable protocol. They deferred this because they didn't know how exactly they wanted to do this. Because the proposal was do it like Array and Dictionary do it, which again changed 20 hours ago. So they had good reason to defer this. If you care about this, watch the Swift Evolution mailing list, get involved with understanding the Swift Evolution process. Um, actually very friendly. Soon, because I really care about this, and also I can hear how folks are going to be able to So, all right, we're gone. Sorry.